Well, good evening. Roll Tide. <laughs> Somebody said, uh, we didn't, uh, Maria said, I didn't know we are doing collegiate day. I said, no, this is just how I normally dress. I've just been doing well all the, these last weeks. <laughs> I've been dressing up for you. <laughs> we're back to normal. It's just Roseanne in the dirt. That's what I am. But uh, I appreciate your prayers as I'm teaching the kids. Um, I spent all weekend grading essays, and um, all weekend, all four days, <laughs> with the holiday till 1:30 this morning, quarter to two, and then got up and finished them this morning. That's about 50 something, and that's not even my college class at uh, on campus, which didn't meet this week. And so I came in, and I'm starting to call roll this morning, and, and I call one girl's name, they went, she dropped, and I go, she dropped, she dropped. I'm like, what's up with that? What do you mean she dropped? They said, we don't know. I was, so we had about five girls drop, and uh, I, I said, well, the few, the brave, the proud. We'll all go along together. But I didn't lose one boy, so that was good. Um, but thank you for praying. Continue to pray because um, to move to a subject like English after teaching the Bible, you know, is kind of like grinding gears a little bit. So uh, um, I'm grateful to be there and I'm grateful to see what God's going to do. But it sure is tiring. You know, when God calls you to do things, you don't always, you don't know what's going to happen as you're in it. And so I was getting the stuff out of the truck tonight, and I thought, well, you know, if we don't have a relationship with Jesus that works when it's difficult, what use is it? And for me, I count more when it's not difficult. <laughs> That's, there's fewer of those than there are when it's difficult. So um, I remember I, was, um, I ran for a lot of offices when I was in junior high, and I never won. And whenever I walked out, Mother would say, now, remember to be a good loser. And so I did that in seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade. I got to 10th grade. I walked out of the door, and Mother once again said, now, remember how to be a good loser. I said, Mom, I believe I've learned how to be a good loser. I would like to know what it's like to be a good winner. <laughs> and I won that day. So that was good, uh, you know, 50 years ago. Uh, but I think when we look at how do we live this life, I was really pondering it today and just thinking of the story we're going to tell about the man who was lowered down through the roof by his friends. Um, it's just one of the funniest stories in the Bible. Um, once again, one of my favorites. Uh, but just that I would ask you to try to put yourself in the room um, in the different seats as we look at it tonight. So let's pray and we'll start. And uh, we're going to read this in three different passages, so we're going to have to, to hurry so we can get it all. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and I'm grateful that we can. Thank you, Jesus, that you, you died on the cross, and you, you bore our sins, and then you rose again, and, and you have, we have victory in Jesus. And thank you that um, the stone is rolled away, all those things that we say. But just bottom line, thank you, Lord, that we can have a life where we know the, the living God. And that you're, you're, um, you know where we are. You know what you have planned for us. You know what's coming around the bend. There's never a, the other shoe dropping because we're always carried in your hands. And Father, thank you that that is the truth with a capital T. Thank you that you're the big G God, not a little G God, and I'm thankful for that. So as we dive into your word tonight, and the words in red, and we see what happens in this passage, that we will, um, our hearts, the eyes of our hearts will be open, that we might see what you'd have us to see. And thank you uh, once again for another opportunity to speak well of your name, Lord. And it's in the name of Jesus I pray, amen. Okay, well, the first passage we're going to look at, let's go to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. This particular story is told three times in the Gospels, and we'll just go in order. 
uh, uh, Matthew, Mark, and then Luke, and we'll, we'll end on Luke. And it's, it's Matthew 9, verses 1 through 8. Now, once again, it's interesting that he, and all the writers, Matthew, all the writers and, and the passages that we read, he is nothing but the paralytic or the paralyzed man. And I think it's interesting in the Bible that people are known by what's wrong with them. <laughs> that, the man born blind. Uh, the prostitute. Uh, the paralytic. Uh, the woman with the blood issue. I mean, she, nobody has names. It's just like the gallbladder in 6C. I mean, I mean you know, um, I just think it's funny. Uh, uh, you know, it's just an observation, but... Sometimes those are fun. Okay, this is the New American Standard. And getting into a boat, he, that means Jesus, crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, <laughs> they were bringing to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Take courage, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This fellow blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why are you thinking evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? Now we could spend all night just on that verse. But in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, then he said to the paralytic, Rise, take up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went to his home. But when the multitude saw this, they were filled with awe and glorified God who had given such authority to men. We're going to read all the passages and then we'll, we'll start looking at them. So go to Mark, Matthew, Mark, the next uh, chapter, Mark, just chapter 2. Verses 1 through 12. Well, I, yeah, 1 through 12. Sort of with each book, we find out a little bit more information. We see here, and when Jesus had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together, so there was no longer room even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. Wouldn't that be amazing? We just couldn't get it. We wouldn't have enough room in here for people to get in? No, that's down the hall. (laughs) But I do think it's funny. When was the last time your neighbor banged on your door and said, please tell me about Jesus? You know, that that there is that we have the truth. We, We have the knowledge. So we need to be praying for the people around us and say, God, give me the opportunity. Give me the faith that that I can share this good news with people. And, you know, I had a girl. You remember Nan? We had a girl in Bible study, and she was in my Bible study since she was, you know, a young mother back at uh, Christ Community. And uh, she would come in with a friend. I'd go, Nan, who's your friend? She'd go, I just met her at Kroger. And I told her I was coming to Bible study. Would she like to come? And she said yes. And so I promised the entire time she came to my Bible studies for 20 years, she met somebody at the Y. She met somebody at Kroger. She met somebody on the street. And she said, would you like to come with me to the Bible study? I would love for you to come. And she was just that excited. I mean, she was just so, like, and they were always like, yeah, sure, I'll come. And I thought when they got there, it was like, you know, Fantasy Island, the plane, the plane. You know, you can't get off. Uh, you know, <laughs> but it was always amazing. And I think that's what it says. Bring them to Jesus. You know, we bring people to Jesus. And we point them in his direction because he's the one with, uh, he's, he's God. So here we go. They've gathered and, they, and he's speaking the word to them. Verse 3, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. In this passage, we find out there are how many men? Four. Why are there four, do you think? Four corners. corners. A friend of mine calls uh, what friends have done for her, what some of us have done for her, we've done for each other, is everybody has a corner. You know, everybody has a corner of her pallet, and and that we take turns being the ones on the pallet. So we have four men, and unable to get to him on account of the crowd, they remove the roof above him. 
And when they had dug an opening, okay, let's just, just put that in your mind, okay? When they dug an opening, they let down the paralytic on which the paralytic, on the, let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus seeing their faith. Now, this is the consistent passage that we have. And Jesus seeing their faith says to the paralytic, My son, your sins are forgiven. But there were some of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, verse 8, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, (laughs) just don't think you can think something around Jesus. He's going to know what you're thinking, okay? Why are you reasoning? And that's an interesting word, reasoning. Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise and take up your pallet and walk? But in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, take up your pallet, and go home. And he rose and immediately took up the pallet and went out in the sight of all, so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Now let's go to Luke chapter 5. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. Now Luke, uh, he likes to combine things. So in my Bible, the little topic here, they have put the, the leper and the paralytic together. <laughs> the leper and the paralytic. Once again, we have no name, just the leper. And... Let's don't forget, it's Luke chapter 5, verse 17 is where we're starting, and we're going to go through verse 26, okay? This is not a part of what we're reading, but I I would like to um, direct your attention to verses 15 and 16. But the news about Jesus was spreading even farther, and great multitudes were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. But he himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. So don't forget that as we are serving God, as we're walking in this world, as we're walking in life, that we have the time where we're not just reading our Bibles or or praying for other people or praying for missionaries, but we slip away and have time with the Lord ourselves where we know how to commune with Him. And and I, I oftentimes will sit down with the Lord and go, I think I've forgotten how to spend time with you. I think I've forgotten how to commune with you because I've been teaching English, you know, and, and I'm in charge. So here I'm sitting down and I have to lay down my burdens. I have to unpack my suitcase. And Miss Helen used to tell a story, my spiritual mom, Miss Helen Wright. And uh, when I first met her, um, I just loved me. I was, I didn't get, well, for 25 years, I loved being around her. But one day she was talking about, I asked her, I said, how do you... Uh, spend time with the Lord, you know, because I was going to write it down, you know, like draw a picture, like do you get on a, do you get on a, like a, do you face out a window, you, you know, do you get on your knees and, and have a passage? I mean, I was, I'm an A personality, and my, well, I used to be, and I'm a B, B plus maybe now, and uh, um, I, I said, how do, what, what do you do? And I was, you know, I had my paper, I was ready to write. The first thing she told me, she said, Rose, a couple doesn't set an alarm to make love. <laughs> well, I'm single. Why did you bring that up? I, I'm like, I thought we were talking about prayer. Yeah, I'm ready to get down. You know, get on your knees, get a passage, keep a, keep a notebook, you know, keep, have a partner who calls you, make sure you're awake to get up in the morning. And what she talks about is a couple making love. And I'm like, well, I don't know this, but I guess that's probably right. And she said, it's not that you have a method. 
uh, you're asking about a method. I'm talking about the master. I'm talking about having time with your heavenly husband. And she said, let me tell you a story. She said, I wanted to spend time with the Lord. And, and she was the first person I heard talk like I've talked to you about hearing from the Lord, where she felt like God was saying things to her, but not verbally, but just instructions in her head. And, and so she said, um, you know, one day I, I wanted to spend time with Jesus. And he said, Helen, what do people down there do when they spend time together? She said, well, I guess they go on a date. She said, all right, let's have a date. She said, okay. He said, how about this Saturday? She said, I'm free, okay. I mean, I'm hearing her tell the story, and this is all new to me, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> all righty, all righty then. <laughs> and um, she said, so I got my Bible and my streams in the desert and my daily light and my, uh, my utmost for his highest and my my tapes that I would play with music and my Bibles and my journal, and I had it all on the, on the sofa. And I was sitting there, and, I, and it was like the Lord said, Helen, on earth do people read to each other out of books on a date? She said, well, no, Lord. They don't. He said, put all that away. All right. So she said, I put all of it away, and I thought, now what are we going to do? And I thought I would, I, I'd be very uncomfortable. I would not know what to do uh, with all my books and everything over to the side. Nothing to hold, nothing, you know, just talk, spend time with God. And uh, this is where it got a little strange. She said, um, he said, Helen, do people on earth hold hands on a date? She said, well, I guess so. He said, he said I want to hold your hand. So she said, I put my hand out on the sofa as if I were holding Jesus' hand. Okay. And she said, I sat there and I thought, I said, Lord, what are we going to talk about? What are we going to do? And he said, well, first, I think you need to think through your week and see if there are anything, the things you need to confess so there won't be anything between us in our relationship. And she said, Rose, I couldn't think of one thing. It had been a good week. <laughs> so I sat there a while and all of a sudden, Something came in my mind. I'd had an argument with the president of the college. And I realized that was pretty big, but I had forgotten about it because, you know, I got busy in my week. And I said, well, Lord, is this something I need to bring to you? He said, yes, Helen, that's why I let it come to your mind. And she said, Rose, for about 30 minutes, God just let things float to my mind, telling me things I needed to confess just giving him an opportunity to bring things to my mind so I could say, Father, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Will you cleanse me? Will you make our relationship new? And she said, and then we had the most wonderful time. Now, I went away from that story thinking that is the weirdest thing I've ever heard. I can't imagine doing that. And I will tell you that I have sometimes been in a place where I have put my hand on the sofa and I said, Lord, I need to know that you're here. I need to know that you're real. I need to know that this is not just something I've made up or you're not all in my mind or, or that you are the powerful one to, to come and help us. And so when she began to talk about prayer, and I realized as I read this that even Jesus himself knew that he needed to slip away from all the things of his world, all the people who were coming. Because see, let's think about it. All those people who were coming to him, he would tell them the truth, right? He would tell them how to know God. He would tell them about himself, about that he was the son of God. So you would think he's just wasting opportunities, you ever heard anybody say that? Well, I don't have time, you know, to get away with God because I'm wasting opportunities. I'm busy. I got to be out there doing stuff. I'm, I'm working with the poor. I'm, I'm going to the hospitals and I'm visiting and I'm leading people to Jesus. And it's like, well, but if you just keep, an, keep giving out and don't take in, don't remember what Jesus wants you to do with him, then when we read these stories, they really don't go in soft soil. When I first started a garden, I had no idea what I was getting into. And my ground is full of rock. A little bit of dirt, 
and a lot of rock. And I realized that I had to amend my soil. So some of us, as we begin to hear some of these things, the soil of our hearts, the soil might be kind of rocky, might be kind of hard, maybe hardened by difficulty or by hurt or sin or, or something that God has said, give that up. And we're like, no, I don't want to give it up or whatever. And he is going to have to start amending the soil of our heart with himself. And when you amend soil, you begin to put things in it like um, compost. Have you heard of compost? Do you know what compost is two years prior to it being compost? It's poo-poo. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's dung. It's, it's, you know, manure. It happens on farms. Manure happens. I always like saying that. Manure happens. I think I ought to have a, a bumper sticker that says that. Manure happens <laughs> on farms. And, and you take that manure, and when you get that manure, you don't put that manure fresh on your little plants because it's so powerful, it's going to actually burn up the plants. It'll actually kill them. But if you lay that manure aside... For a couple of years, add some leaves and maybe some, some scraps from your, your house and keep kind of st stirring it and turning it. In about two years, you have something that we might call black gold. You have something that if you had put it on the plant two years before, it would burn it up. But when you put it on the plant's roots now, it gives them something where they can grow and it has it feeds the roots, and it allows them to grow more. You know what? God takes the manure in our lives, and it just takes some time before he can amend it enough that one day we realize even the bad things that have happened to us, even the choices that we made are bad, that God in his mercy adds himself into that, and one day he says, now you're going to grow because of the very thing you thought was the worst thing that ever happened in your life. And it stunk to high heaven. Well, let's don't even talk about chicken poop. Let's don't even get there. Some people use that. But woo! Some of us have that in our lives. But we have to realize that God wants to prepare our hearts. And that is a daily thing. You know what? When I left my garden for a day or two, it didn't like that. The, the, it was almost like there was a sign down the road that said, The lady hasn't been out in a day. Come on down. Deer would come in. Uh, uh, bugs would come in. And weeds. Oh, my gosh. I hate weeds. And weeds will thrive in drought. I don't, I don't understand. It, they thrive in drought. So you have to constantly be working on your garden. And that is what we see in our hearts as we come. And we see God working on our hearts. Now in a moment, we're going to see the Pharisees and the scribes and these people who've gathered. It says from every city, from these, little, from these towns, but their hearts are not soft. They're not there to hear Jesus tell the truth. They're there to reason, to have logic, to say this is, he can't be who he says he is because we don't believe that. <laughs> well, guess what? God is God whether you believe him or not. I just, that's hard to know. It's hard to hear. I understand. But he doesn't need me to believe him to continue to be God. He does not need me to believe him to continue to be God. And so sometimes what we say is, Lord, I want to believe, but I don't believe. So help my unbelief. Kelly Willard, a um, uh, uh, phenomenal songwriter um, and a wonderful woman, uh, has written some beautiful music. And um, one of the songs that I, in my MGB... With my 8-track, I had two 8-tracks. I'd gotten both off of a sale rack in a Christian bookstore. I'd never been and didn't know they had one. It was a Baptist bookstore then. It, you know, Baptist bookstore that we didn't have anymore. And um, they had these 8-tracks on sale for this girl. And it was called Blame It on the One I Love. And then a little later they came out with one called Willing Heart. And the one called Willing Heart is, a, is an amazing one. It says, if you don't have a willing heart, ask and he'll give you one. 
If you can't seem to make a start, trust in his power. And the Lord of love, he watches you. He sees what you're going through. And he will make a way if you want him to. Oh, do you want him to? Then tell him so. So sometimes for me, I say, I'm willing. But then I have to go, I have to be willing to be willing. And then sometimes I have to be willing to be willing to be willing. And then sometimes I have to be willing to be willing to be willing to be willing. Sometimes I have to go way back and say to the Father, I don't have a whole lot of desire to be willing. But as an act of my will, I say, I want to be willing to have you walk through me, live through me, show me what I need to know. Because... Ladies and gentlemen, we're not put on this earth to to get everything right. We're put on this earth to have relationship with God and know about Him, share that with others, and then one day be with Him in heaven. Guess what? We're all going there. Some of us sooner than others. Because we don't know when we're going, right? Only the Lord knows when we're going. And so when we get to this passage, I want to be the kind of friend to my friends who would be the one to say, you know what, we're going to get you to Jesus. I'm going to do whatever I can do to get you to Jesus. Now, it would be easier for some of us if all we had to do was put a hole in somebody's roof to get our friend to Jesus. For some of us, that would be much easier than bearing the burden of what we're having to do and praying for our friends, sticking by them, believing in them, believing for them when they can't believe themselves, not being uh, someone to facilitate. Sometimes that walking is very difficult in being a friend who has the faith that Jesus is going to look at and say, and seeing her faith, he said to the paralytic, rise and walk. This story is explosive. So let's see what it says. Verse 17, chapter 5 of Luke. And it came about one day that Jesus was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. That's a lot of folk, okay? you got a lot of powerful people who've come. But don't miss out on what else was there that day. And the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. I don't know if we look at it that way. We see the, 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 these teachers, the Pharisees and teachers of the law were present. But Luke wants us to know that the Holy Spirit, the power of the Lord was also present. If you have not seen that before, that is a kicker part of that verse. I'm glad they were there. God knows when there's adversity, when there's difficulty, the power of God has to show up too. The power of God has to be present. And guess what? He is present in you. If you believe in Jesus and the Spirit of the Lord abides in you as it does when you ask Him to be your Savior, then the Lord is in you. So as you go into a circumstance, you may be as Dumb as a donkey. But when you go into that circumstance, the power of God is coming there through you because the Spirit of God lives in you. See, if we begin to really believe that, and we get into a place, who was it? Um, He wrote Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Uh, Josh McDowell. (laughs) Years and years and years ago, Josh said, you know, I really, sometimes when I get on a plane, I just want to stand up and say, you're welcome. You're welcome because I belong to God. He's going to take care of me. And all of you will get the residual effects of that. I'm like, what an ego tripper. Oh, my gosh. I mean, but then when, I began, he, when you ratchet it down a little bit, you begin to realize that as you go places, the Spirit of God goes with you. See, it's the power of God in us. It is the power of God in us that brings the glory. As I stand in front of my students, I'm praying, oh, God, be the glory of God through me as I talk about argumentative essays. And their eyes glaze over. And that little fella is back there on his phone. He's not going to do that anymore in class. I just (laughs) would like to report. (laughs) It was funny, but I had to kind of keep it on the down low. But... It is the power of God in us. And and if I cannot believe that, 
I have to stop there and ask God, help me believe that you live in me. Help me believe that you love me enough that you are in me. If we don't do that, then we're not going to really believe that he forgives us our sins. That that's the bigger miracle than healing a paralytic. Let's see what happens. And behold, I love the word. Some men, Mark says they. Some men, once again, we don't get their, we don't get their names. Just some men. Some men were carrying on a bed, a pallet, um, a man who was paralyzed. And they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of Jesus. And not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles and his stretcher right with his stretcher right in the center of the front of Jesus. Okay, we'll stop there for a moment since we've read the story. This is our third time. You, you need to see it through my eyes. Um, we see in, 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 I believe it was in uh, Matthew, or maybe it was Mark, said he's come home, that he's in his home. But he didn't really have a home, so it's somebody else's home. He just stays places. Well, in this one, I kind of think that it's this lady who's the hostess of it, you know, she's a nice Jewish lady, and she's hosting Jesus, uh, the teacher, the rabbi. And so she has all these important people who, come, who have come to her house. Now, just think about it. Those of you who do entertaining, what do you do when people come to your house? I lock the door. I don't let them in. I'm like, I don't have any candy. <laughs> but those of you who are hospitable and, 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 and have houses that you can actually walk into without stumbling over things, you have people come in and you prepare food and you have drink and you have places for people to sit and, and you're wanting to make sure as a hostess that they're feeling welcome. And if you have dignitaries come, oh, it's a big honking deal then, right? You got these dignitaries there and, and you're, you know, now we're like telling people, guess who's come to my house? A little text thing. You know, we, we're, we're just over the moon. So I want you to get the fact that this little Jewish lady, this, this lady has, she has gotten her, her drapes cleaned. She has brought in the caterer. She has had, it's spotless. And she has been so busy. She's patting the, the, the perspiration from her head when she finally sits down because now they're going to hear from the rabbi. And all of a sudden, she, she feels something hit her shoulder. And all of a sudden, she realizes that someone is digging a hole through her roof. You got to get this. Come on, come on. What more fun are you going to have this week than right now? <laughs> they're digging a hole. One says it says tiles. The other one says they're digging a hole. You know, it kind of makes you think they're like unlocking tiles and put it to the side. No, they're digging a hole. Okay? And can you imagine being on this side of it, and as they continue to dig a hole, all of a sudden those four men's heads look down through the hole, all the way around the hole. Looking down. And the place is packed. You can't move. I mean, it's standing room on. People are outside in the streets. And all of a sudden, these men are digging a hole. And, and all of a sudden, imagine that they're looking down at Jesus. And they're like, yeah, this will work. Now, they didn't bring him with rope and stuff, you know, to lower him down. Because they thought they could just take him to Jesus. Well, they weren't prepared. So can you say, you got any scarves? You got what you got on you that we can tie to the edge of this? We got to lower him down. Okay, it gets funny if you really start thinking about it. Because they don't have a pulley. They have to let him down a little at a time. So here's this paralyzed guy. One, sometimes he's down like this. Sometimes he's down like this. Sometimes, like, come on, do it better than that. He's not, he can speak. But he's paralyzed. He can't move. So he can't make them stop. <laughs> he, he can't say, I'm not doing this. They're like, well, tough. <laughs> you can't do anything about it. <laughs> Don't you love your friends? They just know you and they just do it anyway. So here they come and they're lowering this man. And they did it to where he's right in front of Jesus. I would say that's pretty good. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't put him in front of a Pharisee over here. Like, what's this man doing in front of me? Oh, sorry. 
<laughs> Wrong one. <laughs> And then another hole. They're digging another hole through there. I mean, they, somebody had to be at the door going, yeah, over to the left, over to the left. You know, so she's left with this hole in her roof. Now, I'm kind of siding with her because this is a big deal. Somebody has dug a hole in her roof when she has all these people here. And guess what? When they leave, there is still a hole in her roof that has to be repaired. Now, those of you who are wonderful hostesses, you would say, oh, don't worry about it, don't worry about it, but you're going to talk about them for a long time, aren't you? <laughs> I don't mind that they did that, but let me tell you what they did to my sofa. So here she is. So they, they lower them down, and as they, he lowers them down, he says something very interesting. And the first time that I ever read this, I didn't really believe it. I didn't know if I believed that this could happen. But we have seen a blind man who didn't ask Jesus to heal him. The man born blind, he didn't ask Jesus to heal him. Lazarus, it was a little hard for Lazarus to ask Jesus to raise him from the dead. Because why? He was dead. So he was, you know, beyond asking Jesus for help. Okay? Okay. But in all the circumstances, it has been that the glory of God would be shown in that circumstance. And, and the, what we've seen in the past, it says that this has happened so that the glory of God may be shown in the moment or that the Son would be glorified. This is a different take what Jesus says here. But I don't want you to miss it. Don't miss it on, on, the, on, the, on the videos. Don't miss it wherever you're looking, wherever that camera is. Um. It says, and seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven you. Seeing their faith. Well, I began to think about this. And here are the friends. They're all looking around the hole because they've lowered their friend. They've got him to Jesus. Man, this is great. He's going to heal. He's going to heal him. But the first thing that Jesus says to him is that his sins are forgiven. <laughs> I think my first response as a friend would be like, sins are forgiven? Wait a minute, what have you been up to? What are we doing here? Well, I thought, what, we brought you here so you would be healed. But Jesus is talking about your sins. There must be something really been going on with you. See, because we will believe for people's healing but when we start talking about sin, when we start talking about stuff we've done, it makes it very difficult to move on. Um, and the enemy wants to destroy our relationships. I've been praying with a couple. There's been difficulty in, in long-term relationships in their lives over something very silly to some people, but very real in other ways. And it has been going on for several months. And Nobody wants to talk to one another because nobody likes conflict, but everybody's talking to everybody else except to the principals. Besides coming and sitting down and saying, let's talk about this. Let's talk about maybe some sin. Let's talk about how I've sinned against you and how I believe you sinned against me. Let's talk about this. Let's get it out in the open. Let's ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins. Us. Now, don't you think maybe the paralytic was a little surprised? So once he's gotten in front of Jesus, that the first thing that Jesus would say to him was not, hey, get up and walk. The first thing that Jesus said to him was, son, your sins are forgiven you. We never hear this man talk. We never hear his story. We don't know anything about him, except he's paralyzed. And evidently, he needed sins that, to be forgiven. If you are in a place, many times what we will do, we will ask God to fix the circumstance instead of fixing our hearts. We just want him to, you know, like something going on, I just want God to change you. Like, quit it. Quit doing that. You're getting on my nerves. Just change her, God. Change this. Change the circumstance. You know, my leg's hurting. Make my leg not hurt. You know, give me more energy. Well, you're 63. Okay, give me something. I don't know what I need. But you've got me in this here. You've brought me here. You've brought me thus far. Remember? What is that thing about raise my Ebenezer? Dun, 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 dun. Forgot the words, but... 
the music lives on, doesn't it? <laughs> I raised my Ebenezer. An Ebenezer is, uh, there, by, I knew my, my hymnist, hymnist knower. <laughs> by thy help I've come. It, 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 we have to remember that we've been brought this far. And I want just to say, if you're in a place right now that you've been praying for God to change your circumstances, my encouragement to you is to stop and ask God to change your heart. Because I have found there are things in my life that I don't think they're going to change. And there's something about being in the middle of it and saying, Lord, if this is what you want, I'm in all the way. Glorify yourself in my paralyzed body. Glorify yourself that in the front of everybody, God and everybody. Let's just say that. In front of God and everybody, his sins are brought to the fore. And they're forgiven by the Son of God. Not by a priest. Not by doing things at the temple. But he's forgiven by the very one who's going to bear all of our sins. And it didn't have anything to do with the man's faith. It had everything to do with his friend's faith. Just, you just kind of go, no, it doesn't work that way. No, he's got to be sorry. He's got to ask forgiveness. You know, he just doesn't get a pass. What is this, monopoly? You know, get out of jail free thing? How, how does this work? Well, see, if Jesus forgives us of our sins, let's take a moment. Is there something in your heart that whenever you kind of get in, in a, a moment, the enemy always brings up that particular thing? Just that particular thing. <laughs> Here it comes in front of your head. Boom. You might have been young. It might have been yesterday. It might have been you were a baby. You were a child. Something happened and you still get the feeling it like just makes you feel strange. You can, your body responds to that when that thought comes in your mind of that particular thing that went wrong or something you did. You feel it in your body. Well, that's some stored up stuff in you. And we have to take that to Jesus and say, you've said that you've forgiven my sins. So help me to understand why am I holding on to this? I told you about the lady I met not long ago, an older, older lady. And when, I, when we were talking about things that maybe we would tell people that we'd never told before, she talked about being the middle child and neglected. I mean, she's like 80-something years old, and she began to weep like she's still the middle child. And she's about to go home, and she's 10 years old. It has the hurt. It's like a spinning sword inside of her. And as soon as that thought begins to spin, it just spins and spins and spins and cuts her insides. That's what I used to describe what happened to me when I would be depressed. I said, something starts happening inside of me, and it begins to spin, and it's like swords, and it cuts me, and I can't do anything about it, and I'm not sure how to deal with it. Lord, help me. And I had to go through a lot of things for that to be dismantled, and shipped somewhere else. But I'm here to, today to tell you that the Lord has forgiven me of my sins. And he's healed me of the paralyzed places in my life because of what's happened to me. See, all of us have paralyzed places in us that when we try to get it to go, it's like, have you ever tried to think about walking on a broken leg? You can't walk on a broken leg. You put weight on it and you're going to fall down every single time. It's the same thing inside of ourselves. If we don't believe God has forgiven us as our sin, we will not extend the grace to anyone else. We will not let them have what God has given us, and that's forgiveness and grace and mercy. Because this is the attitude. If I have to go through it, so do you, sister. I'm not going to let you get away with that. We will require a other people what standard we put ourselves to we do not have a double standard if we hold ourselves in contempt we will hold others in contempt at some place because that is how we operate this man is in front of Jesus and everybody that's important everyone who's important in the entire area and he has lowered in in the most humiliating fashion that he could be brought into he is lowered down 
unevenly. See, we just think it's like a movie, right? Like, you know, they just they lower like, like pulleys or something. Okay, and they just lower him down. No, clods of wood, you know, grass, digging it out, you know, putting him down, bumping in front of Jesus. Jesus said, your sins, friend, I love it that he calls him friend, friend. I don't, how, did he call, I would have to go and look. I, would, I just challenge you. I wonder if he called other people friend. I wonder if this is the, I think this is the only place I remember that he looks at somebody and calls them friend. That's a little trivia question, isn't it? A little Google something or another. I mean, he calls him friend. He's never met him, and yet he calls him friend. Why? Because he is about to allow Jesus to do something amazing in front of all these people. God has used this man to do this. And it said in the scribes in verse 21, and the Pharisees began to reason. Let me, let me encourage you. I like logic. I like to figure stuff out. But when I begin to reason in my mind without bringing God in the middle of it, I'm going down a wrong path. I'm going to come up with the wrong conclusion. The Pharisees and the scribes began to reason, saying, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? I just love it. They, well, no, he, nobody can, mister. God alone can forgive sins. But Jesus, aware of their reasonings, answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins have been forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? When I first encountered that verse, I was stunned. Because I have to admit to you that I felt like that it was a bigger miracle to heal a paralyzed man than it was for Jesus to forgive him of his sins. Sins, forgiveness of sins had become such a common thing. A church kid, you know, grown up in the church, you know, Christian a long time. I just, it had lost its edge for me. It had lost the reality that, that, that Jesus can forgive us our sins is a big deal. Which is easier to say, your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk. But in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise and take up your stretcher and go home. So first he forgave him of his sins, then he healed him. When the real work got done, then he said, well, I can heal you too, son. But the main part is, is that your sins have been forgiven. So he went home doubly free. Free from his sins and free from a body that did not respond. He came in on a bed and he walked out a free man. That's what we can offer people. That's what we need to remember. When we come into the presence of God, we're feeling whatever. We go into the presence of God having something to deal with, and we walk out free people. We walk out cleansed. We walk out uh, exposed. We walk out, we don't have any more to hide. A friend of mine, her, her, her uh, big sister found them uh, what was it that we used to, there was this weed, rabbit weed. Did anybody else in the country, did you ever smoke rabbit weed? I think that's what it's called, rabbit weed? Rabbit what it was? Rabbit tobacco. rabbit tobacco. I didn't know what that was. We never did it, but I knew people who, who smoked this, and I, I wasn't going to do it. My daddy would kill me just for being good, so no telling what he would do to me if I... <laughs> If I did something like that, I wasn't going to test those waters, no siree. But anyway, her big sister saw her and her cousin behind the barn smoking that rabbit tobacco. So when she, they got in the car and, and she was on her side and she was beginning to, to fuss about it, she said, if you don't let me sit here, I'm going to tell Mama that you and whatever her name is smoked tobacco, uh, rabbit tobacco out behind the barn. And so this went on for a long time. She said it just went on and on. And finally one day they were in the car and her sister was blackmailing her again. And finally she said, Mama, Rebecca and I smoke rabbit tobacco behind the barn. <laughs> and she smiled at her sister. There was nothing more that she had to hold over her. She told her mama herself. And her mama said, did you get sick? 
She said, yeah. She said, have you done it since? Nope. Okay. I mean, that's all she had to do. Went for months doing everything this mean big sister wanted her to do and blackmailed her to do because she had caught her doing something and was blackmailing her. Only the enemy blackmails you. Only the one who does not have your best interests at heart does those kind of things. And you and I better be careful because sometimes we do it to the people we love. <laughs> Most easily. We're mean to the very people we love. When in fact, we should be the ones extending grace. Don't be the one saying, I'm going to tell you for smoking tobacco, rabbit tobacco behind a barn. Or remember when somebody's been ugly. Or remember when they... Uh, their slip was showing or, or, or whatever. We don't wear slips anymore, not many people. But anyway, you're sl- snowing down south, you know, whatever the deal is. You know, when you do something, you, you slip up and your real self comes out and someone observes it and you're like, oh my gosh, I've been found out. Oh, that should free you up like a big dog. That you would say, I did it. I, I am. I'm a sinner. I need a savior. And if that person doesn't accept you, it really doesn't matter because they lowered the man in front of the Pharisees. They lowered the man in front of the hostess of the house. They lowered the man in front of the teachers, the ones who were the, 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 the ones that you would think would have all the power, who would know what to do. No, they lowered him right in front of Jesus. And Jesus didn't know what to do. So he says to the people, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this so you will know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Verse 25, and at once he rose before them and took up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. You're not going to forget what you have done in the past. You're going to remember. He he took that bed home with him. He took up his bed and went home. So he took with him the reminder of where where he used to be. And also, he's in the Bible forever as the paralyzed man. (laughs) And the one who's lower down in front of Jesus through the roof, his friends, you know, dug a hole. You know, and afterwards, I can can just think of them, you know, as they're they're, uh, drinking Coke together, you know, around the table. Him saying, I can't believe y'all dug that hole. And then he says, I didn't dig that hole, y'all did. When she comes around asking, y'all going to have to be the ones to fix that hole. (laughs) Not me. I was on the pallet. (laughs) But then verse 26, and they were all seized with astonishment. The words are very important. What does it say in your Bible? That, what, what's the action verb that, that you have in your version? Amazed, struck, stunned. I love that word, stunned. When you are stunned at something, it, it makes you stop. And when the very thing that you thought would embarrass him and what is, he's been paralyzed all this time, it says that all the people there were seized with astonishment. Now, what was present that day that allowed Jesus to heal? The power. What does it say? Look back up there. What does it say? The power of the Lord was present to heal. Jesus did nothing on his own initiative. He didn't carry it. He was God, but he didn't take that for anything. He waited for God to give him what he needed for the moment, and God gave him what he needed for the moment, and what he needed for the moment was the power to heal. There, this is really full of stuff if you'll take the time to unpack it. The things that we see about Jesus, how it relates to you, That now that Jesus is glorified, now that he is by the Father, now that the Holy Spirit is with us, we're in a different place than these people are. The the Spirit of the living God lives inside of us. And it is the desire of God that we know him fully. And I don't want us to get to heaven. I I used to imagine that I would get to heaven if, if I... You know, was afraid to let God work through me and that Jesus would take me and put his arm around me and he said, come, let me show you what could have happened if you had just trusted me. I want to trust him now. When I get to heaven, there's no more need for me to trust him because I will see him face to face. I will know him face to face. Now it's the faith for us to step out and say, 
if you'll do it for Roseanne, if you'll do it for that man, I know you'll do it for me. Give me the want to, to want to, to believe. Give me the want to, to want to confess. Give me the ability to begin to live differently. And live differently in front of people that they begin to say, what's different about you? What's different about you? Remember last week I told you about the gardener who is, is one of the minor chiefs in, in Malawi. And he's been coming and being discipled by Christian in this group. And his life has changed so radically that the man that he is a gardener for has come to Christian and, say, and said, I want you to teach me what you're teaching him because he is different. He has changed. Actually, he's coming to work on time and he is actually doing his job and he's coming every day. But that evidently was that would not be the only thing that would cause a Hindu man to come to a Christian man and say, I want to meet with you to find out what you're telling my gardener if it weren't life changing. If the Spirit of God was not there in power. Do you see what I'm saying? It took the power of God for that man to change. And so we ask God, put your power here and let us walk in the power of God that you would begin to do what needs to be done through us. Because I don't know about you, sometimes I feel like I'm just a broken down old woman. And what in the world can God do with me? So what I do sometimes is I pray for the young people. Isn't that sad? I pray for, well, I can't do it anymore. I'm over the hill. I'm just going to pray for the young people. And may God bless them. And may they save the world while I sit here and rot. Until I close my eyes in death and open them to the face of God. I am in that place where the, the spirit of the living God will come in power. And he will do his work through me. If I will let him. If I will begin to say, yes, come Lord Jesus. Come and do it. The paralyzed places in my life, I can tell you. And, and uh, there are people here who have known me a long time. But it has been a long road of trying to be healed. And I'm still not there. But I am not where I used to be. Sometimes the very beginning of healing is when you say, I don't know what I'm going to do next. I just know I'm not staying here one minute more. I'm not staying here any longer. I'm not doing this anymore. I don't know what I'm going to do, there, but I'm not doing this. If that same sin keeps coming around like the fair, once a year it rolls into town and you say, boom, now I've got it, it's bothering me all I'll go over again. You say, I want to tell you whoever's bringing that sin, you're bringing it to the wrong person. You need to deliver that to Jesus. It doesn't belong to me anymore. It belongs to him. So just pack up your tents and leave me alone in the name of Jesus. There was this little thing somebody said. It was like there was this damsel in distress, and she was, she was in this home, and, 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 and the bad man was the landlord, and he was banging on the door, and he's like, pay the rent, pay the rent. She said, I can't pay the rent, I can't pay the rent. And you do it with this mustache and bow tie and all that kind of stuff. And he's like, pay the rent, pay the rent. I can't pay the rent, I can't pay the rent. Pay the rent, pay the rent. And then all of a sudden the man said, I'll pay the rent, and it's the Savior. And when I heard that, there were things that would come and bother me. And as I thought about it, I would go, I can't pay that rent. I can't pay that rent. And Jesus says, you don't have to pay that rent. I've paid that rent. Send them to me. <laughs> Isn't that great? Leave me alone in the name of Jesus. You go to Jesus. It is his, not mine. Can you think of one thing that comes around every year like the fair that bothers you? Maybe sooner maybe just maybe whatever the when it comes in and you're like oh I wish I hadn't done that or I wish I hadn't said that or I wish I had and you just have that regret over and over and I'm just saying is there one thing that you can think of and and let's think about how we would lower that friend our friends would lower us down in front of Jesus and that he would look. Can you imagine what it was like for those guys? I just love thinking about all their little foreheads in that hole. <laughs> he, we got him here. It worked. Can you make bad? It worked. Oh, don't put any more dirt down there. Be careful. Sorry. Sorry. We'll fix it. He's a, he can do that. 
And Jesus looked up at them. It just gives me chills. And Jesus looked. I can't even imagine what that would be like for Jesus to look up at us. Pick three other people and me. Or two other people and me. There will be four of us. And think about being somewhere where we're looking and we've brought somebody to Jesus or we've done something. And when we look up, Jesus looks up. There's a look from the Lord. And we all share it. And we say, can you beat that? That's what Miss Ellen used to say all the time. Can you beat that? And I would go, no, ma'am. No, ma'am, I can't. She would tell these stories of just amazing things. And she'd go, Rose, can you beat that? And I'd go, no, Miss Helen, no, ma'am, I can't. Can you beat that, that he would do this for us? We have to remember that our friends need to be the ones who are willing to bear our pallet for us. Remember when you help other people, you don't carry the whole bed. Some of us are carrying the whole bed. We don't want anybody else to help us because we'd like to get all the credit if something happens. Let's just be honest. And, and you know what? When we share the end of somebody's palate, we got to do it with three other people. It's just hard to work with folks, isn't it? Because we got the idea of what this person needs to do to change. And these people getting on my nerves. Y'all just leave her alone because I got what she needs to do. I'm telling her. That we would be the friends to pray for one another. And Miss Helen used to say, a lot of times God will show you something in someone else's life for you to pray, not for you to confront them. Someone else's life, that's singular, to confront her or him. I'm trying to get my pronouns and antecedents to line up now. I have to start thinking in a grammatical, correct way now. Now I've even forgotten my point because I got so far up into the grammar. <laughs> Sorry. I'll try to find that rabbit trail. Come back, come back, come back, come back. Come back. Miss Helen, well, that we would have the people to pray. That we would work together. That's what the body of Christ is. That we believe that one day we will all be like Jesus. One day we will all be like Jesus. Maybe not today. But one day, I believe that you will be like Jesus. And sometimes that's what people need to hear. We need to look at each other's face and go, Brother, I believe that one day you're just going to be just like Jesus. But the power of God is in you right now today to do the will of God. Can you imagine? I believe that God is is going to be evident in your life. I don't have any more. I believe that in this story, it has enough for us to see about the Lord, about how your faith can help someone else be healed, how God wants us to see that He forgives sins first and heals he does things for people they don't even ask for. What kind of God is that? I would make everybody pay dues. I mean, you can't get in unless you pay. No, he just indiscriminately heals people. He indiscriminately says, brother, your sins are forgiven because I've seen your friends. And you know what? He saw something. Well, he's God. He knows what he's doing. But sometimes people can know who you are by looking at your friends. By looking at who's around you and say, man, y'all are a force I want on my side. Instead of, I don't want to be around y'all, y'all are dangerous. No, let's be the people who say it is God in us for the hope of glory. It is God in us. It is Jesus. It is his saying, do you think it is easier to say, take your bed and walk, rather than your sins are forgiven? You need to ponder that this week as we go through this next week. As we look, I think we're going to look at the passage, and there are several different passages, but where the men are in the boat 
and and Jesus is asleep, and they are, they're about to die. It's a funny. It's one of the funny. Once again, it's just one of the funniest passages. They say some of the dumbest things. I mean, along with Cleopas, they say one of the dumbest things anybody could ever say to the Son of God than what they say to him. Basically, what they say is, "Do you not care that we are perishing?" <laughs> Don't you think that's the funniest line to the Son of God? Do you not care that we're going to die? <laughs> well, yeah, that's why I'm here. <laughs> You know, that's why I'm doing all this stuff, bro. <laughs> you know, and I'm not going to let you die. Well, I'm sorry. That's, we're getting into the story. But let's pray. Lord, I knew we didn't have a whole lot to say, and I, there's no need my going on and on. But I'm just really stunned with the people in that crowd. What a great word. That we're stunned, that we're amazed, that we are astonished. What it says, am I seized with astonishment? Just paralyzed themselves with astonishment that Jesus was the man who could forgive sins. And that he said it out loud, I'm doing this so you will know that the Son of Man can forgive sins on earth. I believe sometimes we really do forget that we serve the living God, the Son of God, the creator of the universe and on all that we see and know and the one who's going to be standing when it all falls down. That you are that one. You are the, the, the triune God. You are the three in one. You are the power that spoke into being the universe and all that we see. You spoke it into being. And you speak that into our lives. Some of us tonight need to know that there's forgiveness spoken on us. Our sins are forgiven. Some of us have paralyzed places inside of us that we just, we just, can't, get, we just can't give up to you. It's just like that's the one thing or those are the things that we just cannot believe that you will take care of in our lives. I pray that we as friends would have the faith for our friends to believe that you're going to come and free them from this per- this paralyzed state in, in wherever it is. Lord Jesus, thank you that we can come to you and we can pray. And Kelly Willard, thank you for her and her the difficult life she's led, but how it has made her write songs if you, it, that would tell me that if, if I want a willing heart, I ask and you'll give me one. Not that I grunt and groan and try and strive, but that I say, Father, give me a willing heart. Please give me a willing heart and you will. Thank you for another one of her songs that comes to mind where she says, I'll cast all my cares upon you. I'll lay all of my burdens down at your feet. And any time that I don't know what to do, I will cast all my cares upon you. Thank you that you are the one we're to cast our our burdens on. And that we're not to carry those, Father. So I pray for the ones here tonight who've carried burdens far too long. They're not theirs. They're not responsible for anyone else but themselves between you and them. That's hard to know when we're mothers and grandmothers and grandfathers and uncles and and moms and dads. and, And it's just hard to know that. But we are not able to change anybody's life. Only you can do that. So have us know what it means to slip away and spend time with you and hear you whisper in our ears of how we're to pray for those around us. May that be the burning light in our lives. More than what we're bearing. More than what the pain we have. More than what the problems we have. But Father, thank you that when we have problems, we can just be gut honest and say, I'm dying inside. I need God to come and that we will bear. Like Job's friends, we'll sit around the fire and weep with one another until you come. And you will come. You've proven it over and over and over again. And so for the ones who are listening to this tonight who don't have the faith to believe for them, I say to you, I have the faith to believe that God will come and meet you where you are. And those of you who are with me, join together with me and let us believe for those who do not have the faith themselves and ask God to come and forgive them of their sins and then to heal them. That we believe for you, friend, friend of God, friend of Jesus, friend of mine. Thank you for another opportunity, Father, to speak well of your name by teaching your word. Thank you for the words in red. Thank you, Jesus, that you spoke. You just didn't just come and not say anything. Thank you that we have your words. 
Help these to go deeply into our hearts. Thank you for this church, for allowing us to have this. May you bless it. May it be a beacon on the hill, Father. And may you be glorified. And it is the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Thank you.